welcome everybody who is uh, on the Zoom uh, webinar. Uh, really appreciate you joining us. Uh, we'd originally scheduled this event in person in Stora Auditorium. Uh, I spoke to Pat a couple of weeks ago and she kindly agreed to uh, help us uh, with this experiment to uh, bring you the Distinguished Leaders uh, event that we promised you, but uh, uh, via uh, Zoom technology. Uh, so once again, thanks to all of you for joining. And I believe we also have uh, international alumni on the uh, call as well. Um, so the power of the Distinguished Leaders Lecture Series is extended now, not beyond, uh, is extended beyond the immediate uh, South uh, Florida region to the national and the international audience as well. Um, so I have a number of questions I'm going to ask uh, Pat. Um, and uh, then uh, uh, I think some questions have been uh, sent in by the audience already. Uh, but those of you who wish to ask a question, please uh, send a question through by text. And uh, we'll endeavor to include as many of those as we can as well. Uh, for the purposes of convenience, uh, the audience at the moment is muted. Uh, so you should all be able to hear us. Uh, Pat and myself, but uh, not necessarily hear each other at this point. Um, so let, let me start, Pat, uh, without uh, again going through your uh, CV, which is fantastic. And I know many, many women executives in the United States rightly view you as a terrific role model uh, for them. You've served on many Fortune 500 boards, have connections in many companies, what are companies doing during this current crisis? We're here to talk about leadership in crisis. Yeah. What are the companies uh, prioritizing? Yeah, well, thank you, John. It's really nice to be with you and all of the folks who have joined. Um, I'm sorry it's not face-to-face, -face, but uh, we're utilizing, I think, technology to the degree that we can. Um, as you said, look, I have the pleasure of serving on some terrific boards with some very strong CEOs. Uh, there is no question that this is the most unprecedented time I've certainly experienced in my career, and I've gone through the dot-com burst and the uh, ensuing telecommunications crash, 9-11, uh, the, the Great Recession, financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and I, I, none of the companies that I'm associated with have seen anything like this, and, and you all know that. Um, it, it, I would say, the first thing I would say is um, this is affecting uh, companies differently depending upon the industries you're in and I see that just from my own perspective being on the General Motors board and being on the Merck board a pharmaceutical company um, they're very different businesses they're very different industries and so um, all of the companies I'm associated with are being affected differently but the CEOs and the things that are going on inside these companies are all very similar they all have crisis management teams they're all very focused I would I would characterize it into three categories the first is people keeping their people safe keeping their people as healthy as possible given the circumstances making sure that they're providing technology and enabling work from home being flexible about hours people can work recognizing some of them are also helping to educate their kids and so the whole category of you know my people um, and trying to keep as many of them as possible secondly i would say serving customers and really business operations to the extent possible, keeping the business running where you can, working with suppliers, working with customers. So there's the whole business operation element. And then thirdly is frankly, making sure every business that I know is making sure that they're running various scenarios around how long this could last. What is it gonna be a V-shaped recovery, a U-shaped recovery or an L-shaped recovery? And what's sort of the best, most likely or worst case scenario? And do we have enough liquidity and do we have enough cash to make sure we navigate through that? So that's kind of what companies are prioritizing. You know, they all have slightly different things that they're doing within those categories, but that's sort of the general sense. The last thing I would say, John, is 
is, you know, there's this notion of sort of playing defense, which is in the forefront right now, really making sure you're doing everything you can to navigate and get through this to the other end. There's also an element of playing offense where possible, meaning really trying to look ahead at the same time and seeing what's going to be different when we come through this that's going to potentially present a new opportunity for us, a new way of working, whether it's within our own businesses, how we operate, how can we, we be more resilient, how can we be more efficient, but also are there market opportunities that are going to be available to us because things are going to be different, right? We're going to get, you know, we're going to move through to sort of a new abnormal and then a new normal. And so the notion of defense and offense is something that's also on, on their minds. So there'd be a short-term survival imperative, then a medium term, how do we relaunch uh, once right. we reopen, and then a long term, how is the industry, how is the cons customer need changing? Right, because look, we will get through this, right? I know two things. This is unprecedented, but we'll get through it. And, and you know, look, I'm inspired by what private companies have done and are doing to step up and work with the governments in trying to find solutions. Uh, you know, GM is making ventilators and masks. Obviously, you know, the pharma industry is hard at work uh, finding vaccines and therapeutics. So uh, it's, it's really quite inspiring, but we'll get through this and you need to have a plan when, when we do. All right, so yeah, Pat, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the dot-com bubble. Uh, you were yes. uh, very much uh, a part of that, uh, not necessarily wittingly, but uh, you happen to be the CEO of Lucent Technologies uh, at that time. So uh, for those of us who, who can't remember, can you just describe a little bit what Lucent's business was sure. uh, and what did you have to uh, do to protect the company uh, and with what results at the time of the dot-com bubble bursting? Yeah. Um, so for those that don't remember, because this was a while ago, and I know you've got, um, you know, different different age ranges, if you will, on the uh, in the session. Lucent Technologies was a spin out of AT and T, a very large spin out that really concentrated its efforts on communications equipment. It was a communication systems leader. If you think of Bell Laboratories, Bell Labs was part of Lucent. And we made, we developed, researched, designed, manufactured the systems that really ran networks all around the world. Wired networks, wireless networks, data networks, optical networks, global company. Came out of that uh, spin and was just on a real high. That was at the time of the, we all remember, some of us remember the internet boom when things got very frothy. And I became CEO of Lucent in January of 2002, which was really the year of um, what we call when the dot bomb bubble, when the dot com bubble burst and the telecommunications industry literally crashed. Uh, I think there was, if I recall, 1.3 trillion at that time of value that evaporated uh, during that year. So it was um, it was like shell shock. Uh, revenue was falling like a knife. Half of our customers went bankrupt. Our cost structure ended up being two to three times higher than we could afford. We were burning over a billion dollars of cash a quarter. Um, we had 70,000 people at the time. Our stock dropped to 57 cents, so we were at risk of being delisted. Uh, we were very close to bankruptcy, if you will. In fact, three firms were in and told me that they thought that was our only way out. So we, we had just an incredible challenge on our hands. Fortunately, we had a good, strong board who was helpful and didn't panic. Um, we had to make a lot of very tough decisions. Uh, we focused on what we could control. We couldn't control the revenue, but we could control our costs. We communicated extensively to every constituent um, that we needed to. We recognized that, you know, taking decisions had to be quick. The perfect was the enemy of the good, so to speak. 
Uh, and so after many months, we were able to get our break-even level down. We took enormous cost out of the business. Uh, we eventually got back to first break-even and then profitability and growth. And after that, recognized that the industry would never, ever again be the same. And the industry really needed to restructure and consolidation was imperative, which led us to the uh, cross-border merger with Ocatel, where we became Ocatel Lucent. So it was a um, it was a scary, challenging time, especially for someone who was new at uh, at really running a company, public company that is. And we had a lot of other issues, but I'll spare you the gory details. But that's sort of the high level. What happened? But if if I can ask you a, a slightly personal question, what what in your background gave you the resilience and the stamina? to be able to do it because this was not, this was not a six month job. Oh no. This no, was no. how many years did it take from the time you took over to Alcatel Lucent uh, coming together? We did, it was probably three, four, five, six, probably four years, four to five, five, five years before we were able to combine. It took us a couple years to get the business back to kind of stable. It, it, took a long time. You know, I, I look, I, um, I think a, a couple of things helped me. Um, one was I had run a turnaround business. It wasn't a public company, but it was a division of AT&T. And so I had some experience with having to make tough decisions to get a business to, to turn around and, and be viable, let's say. Um, but but on the on the personal side, uh, look, I found I, I'm a high energy person for one, which is which is helpful in times like that. So that was just sort of a blessing. Um, but I think I think mindset and attitude. I think attitude is everything. I, in fact, I used to have a, a poster on my door that said, "Attitudes are contagious." Is yours worth catching? Um, because I think they matter a lot. Optimism matters. You have to believe the sun's going to come up tomorrow. Um, you need to have outlets for stress. You need to have support from your family, your personal life. I mean, I was never home uh, for a long time or home uh, little, let's say. And the other thing is, who do you surround yourself with? The team that is with you when you are going through a crisis matters a lot and i used to have a category i used to have a category energy givers and energy takers and you know there are people who work with you who just give you energy they are full of ideas they're full of energy they're they're we can get it done and then there's the woe is us we'll never get it these are the you know and i just kept the energy givers and moved aside the energy takers. I happen to have a great CFO who was a wonderful partner. And he's a CFO of a large public company today. And he and I, I think he and I made a very complimentary team. So, I mean, that's, that, that's how you do it. Mindset, who's around you, what's your attitude, and you need a lot of energy. And um, what, what was the uh, strategic rationale for the Alcatel-Lucent merger? And how did yeah. that work out once, once you took that over? Yeah, it was, uh, so, so the, ra the rationale was, um, was really driven by what was going on in the communications industry. Y you may recall there were seven to 10 large, just, I'm just talking about in the US, uh, operators, telecommunications operators. I mean, you had MCI, you had WorldCom, you had AT&T, you had Bell South, you had, there were a lot of them. Well that ultimately consolidated down into three players. You had Verizon, AT&T, and Sprint for the most part. So the customer base around the world was consolidating. There were just too many equipment providers. And so the strategic logic, frankly, was how do you survive? We had no pricing power. There were way too many of us investing in the same thing. And it was very clear that the industry had to consolidate. And that industry, by the way, went from what was 10 or so players. They're now down to three. It's Ericsson, Nokia, which is what Alcatel, Lucent, Siemens, and 
and, and Nokia were, and then Huawei. So there's only three players today to speak of. Okay. Uh, coming back a little bit to the, uh, the crisis uh, mode, but perhaps uh, stemming from your experience uh, with Lucent, do, is there a difference between the qualities that are required of what you might call a wartime CEO uh, versus a peacetime CEO? Well, let's see. I, uh, I, I would distinguish experience from qualities. And, and let me just first say, it is very helpful when, if you hit a crisis, it's helpful to have been through at least one in the past, right? Not everybody, not everybody gets that opportunity, but experience leading through really tough times and making tough calls is certainly helpful. From a quality standpoint, look, I, I think, you know, peace, peacetime, you know, when there's no crises, CEOs can have these same qualities. I just believe when things get tough and you really are leading through a crisis, the kinds of qualities that matter are, uh, are you objective and fact-based in, in really understanding what decisions have to be made? Are you decisive? You know, you can't dither around when time is your enemy. Let's say you got to be able to be decisive. You have to be able to accept that everything isn't going to be perfect. You have to have empathy because invariably when you're leading through these kinds of things, decisions you're going to make affect people and we're all human beings. So there's an element of empathy that I think is really important that has to come through. You have to be a really good communicator because the leader of an organization is the person that everyone looks to, to see what are they saying? How are they saying it? Are they confident? Are we going to get through this? Are they dealing with reality? So comfort with communicating and finding the balance between sort of the ugly truth with the optimism about how you're going to navigate, I, I think is really important. And then I would just add, you know, urgency, energy, conviction, those are the kinds of qualities that I think are important when you're really sort of in a war. One, one of our audience members sent in a question, which is, uh, what's the hardest decision that you had to make in a crisis? Uh, I, I think the toughest decisions really have to do with people. And... Um, it, it, and it, it really goes back to what I what I said earlier. I mean, when you have to make a decision to reduce the size of your workforce by half, you know that you are impacting a lot of people's lives, their families, their situations. And yet, you know it's unavoidable because if you don't take some of those tough decisions, then you may not have a company right? Yeah, then 100% of the people are affected. And, and I had to learn that because I'm a, I'm a pretty compassionate and empathetic person. And that those have been my most difficult decisions. I, I never wanted to have to tell anybody they didn't have a job. But when in fact, you can't afford it. Um, and you've looked at every other way possible, those are really tough decisions. And so the toughest decisions, they aren't, you know, should we do this merger or buy this product or make this or invest in that? They tend to be, they tend to be people centric for me anyway. You know, I'm sure others would have very different, very, very different um, sense of that, but, but that at least is for me. And the only other thing I'll add is there's the tough decisions, the, the ones that are sort of painful. Then there's the complicated decisions, right? A decision to do a merger cross-border between a French company and an American company was a very complicated, difficult decision because of its complexity and, and, and a certain measure of uncertainty. Those are hard too, um, but sort of less tough from my standpoint because they're less personal. Yeah, so a distinction between an emotionally tough decision yes. and a just a, an intellectually tough decision. Yes, and, and, and yes, an intellectually complicated decision, which Got which it. makes them tough, right? There's lots of pros, lots of cons, lots of opinions, um, and where there's uncertainty, and you're sort of charting, you know, you're you're in uncharted waters. Those those can be difficult. Um, 
sticking with the people theme for a moment, um, what, what's your sense over the uh, span of your career about the progress, uh, if any, that has been made in terms of diversity and inclusion uh, with respect to corporate America, with yeah. respect to uh, boards? Uh, what's your experience and what more should we do and how? Yeah, uh, that, that's a great question. I, I get asked that a lot. And my career has been long. Um, and so, you know, I have to objectively say from the time I entered the workforce at IBM and was the only female marketing rep in the office um, and the environment in which I worked to today, we have made enormous progress. So, I mean, the, I think corporate America is doing a better job year by year but we are not where we need to be and we're not where everybody wants to be. I mean, the sheer numbers tell you that, yet you can see progress. Um, I've been passionate about, the, um, about diversity and we'll talk about inclusion in a minute, but look, I've been passionate about diversity for a long time. For me, I, you know, maybe it has something to do with the fact that I was a woman in a somewhat male dominated industry. Um, but when I think about diversity, I think two things, best talent, best ideas. And when you have the best talent and when you have access to the best talent, you get the best ideas and you make better decisions. It, I mean, it's as, it's as simple as that. There's a lot of other things that could be said about it. But for me, I can't imagine why any company would wanna have their senior leadership team sitting around a table where everybody is basically looks like everybody else and has similar experience sets, especially given who we're selling to, who's making up the talent base, where we're trying to recruit from. It's so important to have a diverse diversity throughout the organization. And a lot, of, and, and, and I do think a lot of progress has been made. The best progress has been made in, in my experience where you set clear goals, you hold leaders accountable, you tie compensation to their progress in really creating diverse teams, you, you, um, you survey your workforce to see if they feel like this is a culture and an environment where diversity is valued. And as, as importantly now, you know, there was a lot of focus on just diversity for a long time. And there's a realization that you can do a lot of great work and bring in talent that's diverse talent, but you have to keep them. And if you don't create an inclusive culture and an in an environment where people who are by definition, not the majority, feel included, feel welcome, feel like they're valued, you're not gonna keep them, right? And so all this work goes into bringing in a diverse talent base but if you can't keep them, you know, you, you have to start over. So a lot, you know, a lot specifically around measuring and managing diversity. And I would argue a lot specifically about measuring and managing the effectiveness of inclusion, which means you're keeping the talent you bring in and you're advancing them in the business. Right. And they feel, they feel included. Got it. Um, Ron Williams uh, is a good friend of our school. He's the uh, lead director at American Express, and he's uh, sent in uh, this question, which is, uh, what qualities do you need to become an excellent non-executive director? Uh, do you think you have to be, do you have to have been the CEO of a company in order to be an effective executive, non-executive director? Yeah, well, for, first I'll answer that, but first I just want to acknowledge Ron because when I talked about Lucent and having a great board, Ron Williams was one of the directors on the Lucent board and was, is, is just a terrific guy. Um, so uh, he's just a, a person that I so admire. Anyway, um, look, I think um, board requirements have been evolving kind of there was a day where it was everybody wanted just CEOs and certainly sitting CEOs are very valuable board members because they have sat in the chair. But I do believe that 
um, as boards look to evolve their um, the experience sitting around the table, you don't have to be a CEO to be a valuable board member. What you have to, I think, bring is some experience set that's relevant to what the company needs. And that could be related to technology. It could have to do with marketing. It could have to do with human capital management. Obviously, financials, former CFOs or folks who have financial expertise, regulatory expertise. So uh, global, have you lived outside the US? Do you understand the global markets? So there's a set of valuable experiences and perspectives that can make a difference on the board. That's sort of at the, at the macro level. Um, I would add that um, recognizing the difference, so, so what makes a good board member? Um, someone who's willing to commit the time, someone who's willing to demonstrate that they're independently minded, someone who brings the value of some set of experience that's relevant to the, comp to the company, someone that appreciates the difference between managing and operating a business and governing and overseeing a business, because those are very different and the role of a director is very different. Someone who can be collaborative, constructive, right? So stylistically, get your point across, but do it in a constructive um, and collaborative way. Those are the kinds of qualities that I think that I think make good board members. Um, you mentioned a global perspective. Uh, one of our uh, uh, audience members, David uh, Sumanth, has asked whether or not you think um, the current crisis, coronavirus induced, uh, will reinforce uh, nationalist sentiment uh, to the extent that globalization will sustain will 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 not be sustained as we have known it in the last uh, twenty years. Yeah, um, I I think it, short answer yes to some degree. Um, we were that path. Co countries were on that path pre COVID nineteen. There was, there's been more nationalism, certainly, you know, here in the United States, but in other countries as well. I think that we should expect to see some rejiggering of our supply chains for critical products and supplies that are considered to be of national significance. I think that will cause less dependence for a company, and I'll just speak for the US for right now, to go outside the US to get things as we found ourselves in this case. So I, I think there's gonna be some, what did we not like about our dependencies outside of the US? And what are we going to do to change that? That will in fact influence a more nationalistic view, I think, I think in some ways. Having said that, we have a global economy. We are going to continue to have a global economy. Trade and, and, and cross-border interactions and engagements are critical for the global economy to be successful. No nation can stand on its own, frankly, in this kind of an environment. So, so I think we're going to see some of that. I'm not, I'm not super concerned at this point in time that you know, we're all gonna hunker down in our cocoons and not be mindful of others. I, 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 don't, I don't think we can do that. Uh, related question, does the coronavirus crisis favor more of a stakeholder view as opposed to a shareholder view of the corporation? Yeah, um, certainly the virus dealing with the crisis because it has so affected, I mean, we are talking about health and safety of people. Um, certainly that has caused every company to, to first say, God, we've got to keep our people safe, right? It, it happens to be 
because they're dealing with a virus, not because companies haven't tried to focus on taking care of their people, right? So, I, you know, there's this stakeholder, shareholder debate uh, as if it's, are you, are we shareholder driven or are we stakeholder driven? I don't think of it that way. I actually believe that the best companies and the best CEOs absolutely understand that you cannot satisfy shareholders over the long term if you do not have the best talent who likes working for you if you're not taking care of your customers, if you're not producing good quality products, and if you're not being a good corporate citizen in your communities. It's just, you can't do it. And so to get into this debate about versus either or, I mean, I just think it's a false argument. I think good companies are by their nature, stakeholder driven. Now, yes, there are times when decisions get made because those who invest in the companies expect a return. And if they don't get it from you, they're going to take their money and put it, you know, give it, give it to somebody else. So, I mean, it's, it's all about what's the right balance. Interestingly, um, more and more investors are actually wanting to understand from companies, not just how are you making your money and why can't you make more? They really want to understand what are you doing for the environment? What are you doing uh, around culture in your organization? So there's a much heavier emphasis on, you know, what's called ESG, environments, uh, environmental, social, and governance kinds of responsibilities than there's ever been in the past. So it, it, it's a little bit ironic that the very shareholders we're talking about are asking, what are you doing about all these other things? <laughs> so, uh... Ernie Fernandez, our IP director at the University of Miami, and he and several other uh, audience members are asking, um, we have changed our habits in response to this crisis. Um, what do you think about the long-term likelihood of sustained changes in the way in which we work, uh, remote work in particular, is being mentioned? Yeah. Um, I fully expect... Uh, and I think it'll be very interesting that as, you know, we move from <coughs> managing and surviving the crisis to, okay, we're coming out of it, we're coming through it, what have we learned? I absolutely believe that working arrangements will change. There, I believe travel, level of travel activity will change. Um, you know, I think we'll all see that yeah, I mean, travel's necessary, but we don't need to travel as much as companies have been traveling and people have been traveling. And when you get that travel time back, you, you, get, a, you get a lot of work time back. <coughs> Excuse me. So I do think there will be change. I don't think it, you know, these things tend to, you tend to get a reaction and then you sort of settle back into um, kind of a new normal. So I don't, Look, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, I think there will be more remote work from home. I think there'll be more flexible work. But I also think there's an element of socialization that people like, which is coming into the office. But I think some of those setups and arrangements are going to look different. I think there's going to be more distancing, more care um, for fear of, um, you know, perhaps a second wave of this or what, whatever may come next. So yeah, I think there's gonna be a lot of changes. Okay, uh, let, let's just go back to your uh, career path uh, for a moment, if we could. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, HP uh, and how you became involved with HP and also how the company came to decide to uh, split itself into uh, two enterprises? Yeah, that's, um, that, that, that's a good question. So. I joined the board of HP in 2011. And it, for those of you who, who probably don't follow HP, but it was at a time in that company's history where there had been a lot of what I would call um, uh, board drama, right? That, you know, CEOs in, out, um, leaks from the board. I mean, they, they the, the company from a governance standpoint was in the press a lot. 
Uh, they had been through a number of CEOs. So it was getting a lot of attention. I was called and asked, would you be willing? They were making some significant changes on the board. Would I be willing to join the board? And, uh, you know, I, I care a lot about the industry. I started in the computing industry, so I had an affinity for the industry and the company. It is an iconic company. It was the first Silicon Valley company of significance. So I joined the board. Um, and shortly thereafter, you know, there were a lot of things that had to be done and decisions that had to be made, but it was very apparent. I mean, HP at the time was like four uh, $25 billion companies four of them, all of which was in and of itself going through technological disruptions, strategic challenges, technology was moving very quickly. And when you have a portfolio of companies like that, that you know, you, how you do your capital allocation, who you give money to, which business you give money to, is often a function of kind of what you can afford as opposed to if they were standing on their own, they would have access to capital that would allow for them to optimize their performance. And so we concluded that, that by separating the company into printers and PCs, more consumer oriented, uh, different business models, different uh, velocity of the business, different development rates, different channels. And then we had the computing software and services business, which is Hewlett Packard Enterprise, that we could get more focus, faster time to market, more management attention, and better capital allocation. I mean, that's sort of the simple, what are the four reasons? That, you know, those would be four large reasons why we believed it was the right thing to do. And we actually did that and created value as a result. And I can tell you after the fact that the company called HP Inc. and then there's HP Enterprises. HP Inc. was therefore able to make investments, buy companies and do acquisitions that never would have been possible if they were part of the broader HP because there were other things that would have been priority, which is an example of what I mean about the capital allocation. So you, you could see it manifest itself um, once we got the company separated. A couple of people, Pat, are asking uh, kind of an interesting question, which is um, in managing through these crises, no doubt there have been occasions when you've made a mistake. Um, what do you do when you made a mistake? Do you, do you admit you got it wrong or how do you approach that, uh, that challenge? Yeah, look, I think um, nobody's perfect. No board's perfect. No, no company's perfect. No management team is perfect. And mistakes get made. Uh, I think um, I just philosophically believe you have to be appropriately transparent. You have to say, look, you know, it's not a, if I had to make the decision over again, I, would, I wouldn't make the same decision. Here's what I've learned from it. Because I think you have to learn from your mistakes. And I think if, you, if you're trying to create a culture within an organization of taking risk, then you have to be able to have some failures. Pick yourself up, say, what did I learn from this? And move on to something else. Um, and, you know, obviously you have to hope that the mistake you make isn't sort of game ending, <laughs> right, for a company. What one of our undergraduate uh, students has asked uh, this question uh, which is quite an important question, I think, especially for young people. Um, what are the two or three things in your early life uh, that shaped you as a leader and enabled you to become a leader? Well, I, in my early life, I'm, I'm assuming you mean sort of before I even got into business. Mm. Um, I had the good fortune uh, <laughs> and you learn from this. Look, I grew up in a large family. I have six brothers and sisters. We were all very close in age. Uh, two of my brothers are disabled and required a fair amount of my mother's time. My father was working. Um, and, you know, I had to, at a fairly early age, be pretty independent um, in terms of doing things that uh, I needed to do and 
and I think independence supports kind of leadership, right? Because you're not necessarily looking around for everybody to help and support. You just sort of have to take charge. Um, so I don't know. I think my family life had had an influence on me. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but I but I I do think that contributed to my level of independence and needing to step up uh, just out of necessity. Um, Linda Nider, who who is uh, <clears throat> the chairman of our management department, Professor Nider is also the uh, the chair of our <clears throat> faculty senate here at the University of Miami. Um, asks what what advice would you give to small and medium sized businesses and entrepreneurs in trying to navigate the current crisis? Yeah, I uh, look. I um, it, this is a tough time, right? And businesses are certainly all being affected differently. Uh, the, the The only thing I can say is I I, I found that when you're going through a difficult time, you have to focus on the things you can control and not spend a whole lot of energy being victimized by the things you can't control. So for small businesses, I, I would say, look, take advantage of whatever help is available. Like there's a lot of programs now to help support small and medium businesses get through this. Um, I would say be as creative as you can to figure out how to navigate this so that when we come through it, and we will, you're in a position to regroup and ramp up as quickly as possible. And that, you know, that probably requires a bit of a balance in terms of getting through, right? You've got to be ready when you get, you, you got to navigate the here and now and make sure you can financially survive. But you also want to be careful not to over rotate where when things open up, because they will, and, and the opportunity may be faster and greater than you think, you, you wanna be able to take advantage of that. So um, look, I, I think there's some percentage of businesses that may not come through this. I think the, the vast majority will. I think many of them will be stronger. And you know, I'm just encouraging folks I talk to to try to be as creative as you can with your teams, you know, with the resources you have in figuring out what you can do differently to navigate this and then what opportunities you can jump on potentially um, as we come through it. But look, I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball here and I don't want to sound Pollyannish. I mean, I know it's a tough time. I have a lot of small business. I have a lot of friends who are small business owners and, um, you know, they're, they're having a difficult time. A uh, similar question. Um... There are, there are thousands of young people, including at uh, our university, who are graduating this spring into yeah. what could be the worst uh, job market in memory. Um, a few words for them. Yeah, yeah again, I, I don't have a crystal ball and I, and I don't, you know, I, I, I never want to sound Pollyannish, but I will say, I, I believe, and you know, everything I read says, you know, the economy will come through this and it will rebound. So there will be jobs. There will also be jobs as we're managing through this, right? I mean, I know in some of the companies that I'm associated with, critical job positions that need to be filled are in fact being filled. I mean, they're minimal, but there will be some jobs. And um, I, I would just say it's gonna be tough. You gotta compete. You might have to be a bit more flexible about what you're willing to do in the near term with an eye on something for the longer term, right? So expand your horizons, expand your thinking, expand your flexibility, and figure out, you know, if some small percentage are gonna get jobs in the short term, figure out how to be in the top 10%. Figure out what you need to do, how you need to show up, how creative you need to be, and, if that doesn't happen, hang in there, don't give up, because there will be opportunities and jobs will be coming back into the economy. It just, it's gonna, it's, you know, it's gonna take a while, probably into 2020, but I wouldn't give up. A part of the debate uh, prior to the uh, stimulus package being finalized was uh, whether 
uh, share buybacks ought to be allowed and whether or not there ought to be some restrictions on uh, executive compensation at public companies that were applying for uh, bailout funding based on the uh, post-2008 experience. Uh, what, what's your take on that? Well, look, I am not a fan of um, uh, governmental authorities uh, providing guidelines around executive compensation. I frankly think that's what the board's job is. Uh, that's, uh, that's a responsibility of the compensation committee and many companies. I mean, I get a report of all kinds of things that are being done with executive compensation voluntarily right, where CEOs are deciding I'm deferring pay, I'm not taking my pay, senior leaders are cutting their pay. So I don't believe that good, hardworking executives need uh, to be told what it is they ought to do. I do want, so that's point one, because I think good people and good boards are going to do the right thing. Um, I do believe, I do think, this happens to be my opinion, I do think that if there is money being provided by the taxpayer, paid for by the taxpayer, because let's face it, the, the, the money the government has is the money of the taxpayers. I do not believe if a, if a company is taking that money to navigate their way through a problem, they should be buying back their stock. Okay. Um, what about the uh, difference? One, one of our MS in leadership students asks, uh, uh, about your take on the, the uh, difference, which you alluded to before, I think, between managing and leading. How, yeah. should, how should we think about the distinction? Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I do, a, I do a session at, I think I mentioned this to you, John, I do a session or did some sessions at the uh, executive education program at the Wharton Business School, and it's around leading in a crisis. And I talk about what I learned about managing and leading. And, and the way I described it for me when I was going through the Lucent situation was managing for me was about what's the plan, what decisions have to be taken, who are they going to affect, how fast is it going to be done, who's it, who, it, you know, it, it's managing things. Leading for me at that time was all about establishing credibility with the people of the business, with our customers, with our investors. It was about communicating. It was about um, showing up with confidence that we would get through that. And so I, I thought of it as what are you doing is managing and who are you being? I know that sounds a little foofy, but who are you being? How are you showing up as a leader? And I point to things like even your language. When you have 60,000, 50,000, however many thousand people looking up to say, are we going to get through this? You can't stand up in front of a group of people and say, I hope, right? There's no such thing when you're the leader of I hope. It's we will. And so little things like word choice and linguistics play a role, I think, in how leaders show up for people in their organizations. Uh, someone asks, uh, is the concept of sustainable business dead? Is survival trumping sustainability? Uh, look, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think right now uh, the dramatic nature of this crisis, the unprecedented impact that we are seeing on not just business activity, but everybody's personal lives. I mean, we're all at home, <laughs> you know, we, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's just a very, very challenging set of circumstances. And therefore, we all think about, okay, I got to survive this, I got to get through this. Uh, but we're going to get through this. Right? We're going to get through this. We're going to have the vaccine or multiple vaccines. We're going to have therapeutic treatments. We will learn from what we, um, what we could do better next time. We will come out stronger and better. And I think all of the things that made sustainability important, <laughs> none of that, in my view, has changed as we look into the future. 
A uh, question from uh, the University uh, of Miami treasurer. Um, how do you think uh, about protecting the balance sheet through this kind of crisis? Uh, debt, equity, other, all of the above? All of the above. I, you know, I think, and, and you know, it, I mean, it's individual, right? Every company that I know of, uh, you know, is looking at what's the impact on our business? How long do we think this will last? What is the worst case scenario? How much cash do we need to get through to next quarter, the following quarter, the full year? What will the impact be? What's our balance sheet look like? What options do we have? I mean, a number of companies are obviously taking their revolvers, um, taking their credit lines just to be sure that they have enough. Some are is doing converts, some are issuing debt. Uh, and um, so there's a lot that's been going on. And I think the Fed, I think the actions of the Fed have made, has, has made that a lot, uh, there's a lot of flexibility, a lot, of, they've acted quickly, let me put it that way. So to the treasurer at, at, at Miami, I, I'd say all of the above depends upon what options you have and which, which, lev which lever works best for you. Final question, uh, Pat, uh, from one of our uh, long-serving uh, staff members here at uh, Miami Herbert Business School. Um, what does uh, this crisis mean for the future of higher education? What advice would you give to those of us in higher education? Well, you know, that's a great question. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not an education expert by any means. So, so I guess I would answer it more conceptually. Um, I think it'll be important for all of the institutions to assess, find a way to assess what has the impact been of, you know, I have grandkids that are, you know, in their freshman year of college and, you know, their whole second half is, is online and, and every school's going through that. There's got to be a way to understand how, um, how effective are we, right? What, what tools are being employed to improve effectiveness? I mean, it's one thing to be efficient, so it's very efficient not to have to go to class, to be able to just dot, dial in. The real question is how effective is it around yeah. learning and how effective is it in developing critical thinking and how effective is it in, in what is normally gained from group kinds of discussions virtually versus in the same room. So I imagine there'll be a lot of findings that will, uh, perhaps reshape how some teaching is done or perhaps make uh, secondary education or, you know, graduate or, I mean, college and graduate education more, even more accessible. But I mean, I, you know, I just don't know what that looks like, but I think there's a lot to look at is really my point and a lot to learn from. And, and I hope we're really, we're really looking at effectiveness. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for focusing on the uh, learning outcomes, which I think are what yeah. are most important to all of us in uh, higher education. Um, so before I, before I thank Pat, I just want to uh, remind everybody, and we had, I think, over 300 uh, people on this uh, call, this webinar. I really want to thank you for supporting this. We would love to receive your feedback. Uh, on uh, how you enjoyed it, how the format, uh, if uh, you have any recommendations for improvement, could be improved. I want to also alert everybody on the call to the fact that on April the 30th, uh, we have managed to secure at 6 p.m. for a similar uh, Zoom webinar, we've managed to secure Dr. David Shulkin, uh, who you will know as President Trump's first Secretary of Veteran Affairs, um, no longer in the administration, but someone whose uh, capabilities are very highly valued on both sides of the aisle. So he will be here 6 p.m. on April 30th to talk about healthcare in the United States. Uh, Pat, I want to thank you again so much for uh, oh, thank you, volunteering John. to be part of this experiment, and I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Thanks for packing uh, so much excitement and uh, insight into the 60 minutes. Really appreciate uh, thank it. Thank you. It's nice to be with you all. Thank you. Good night uh, to everybody. Night. Stay safe. Thank you.
Bye.